Lo, I will spread prosperity over Jerusalem like a river, and the wealth of the nations like an overflowing stream. I will spread prosperity over Jerusalem like a river, and the wealth of the nations like an overflowing stream. And dear people of God, that is my prayer for you for the second half of the year. That God will spread prosperity over every one of you like a river. And prosperity here, think of prosperity, wealth is prosperity, good health. The health you enjoy is prosperity. Inner peace is prosperity. Success in your work is prosperity. So I'm praying for all of these, for each and every one of you, not only for July, but throughout the second half of the year. Amen. Amen. Let me begin with a question. Are you able to rejoice even when you are sitting in ruin? Are you able to encourage yourself even when all the odds are against you? The first reading of this morning is from Isaiah chapter 6 to 6. That belongs to the third part of the book of Isaiah. The people of Israel had returned from Babylonian captivity and they see Jerusalem in ruins. But they have come back to hard times. Jerusalem, the city of the Lord, was not as glorious as it was in the past. So you can imagine their disappointment. You can imagine how they felt the odds were against them. Then God gives his prophet this message. Rejoice with Jerusalem, all you who love her. That even though Jerusalem is in ruins, rejoice with her, all you who love her. Why should you rejoice? Because I am going to spread prosperity over her like a river. That is why I ask the question, are you able to rejoice? When the odds are against you, when you are sitting in ruins. Brothers and sisters, it is not the kind of rejoicing which comes from going to the beer bar. Or which comes to your going to your bar at home and drinking and feeling good and say, I am rejoicing. No. I am talking about that deep seated spiritual disposition and attitude which is grounded in a firm faith and trust in God. That kind of rejoicing, my dear friends, is only capable for those who are always able to look into the future with regards to what God can still do. That even though they are sitting in ashes, even though they are sitting in ruins, they are still looking into the future to what God is capable of doing. And that is what Isaiah was telling the people. That yes, Jerusalem is destroyed. Yes, the temple is no more. But God is saying rejoice because of what I will do. It is like in Isaiah 43... When the prophet tells the Israelites, the things of the past remember not. Because behold, I do a new thing. Can you perceive it? So the Christian is one who doesn't always dwell the glory of the past as against the frustrations of the present and loses hope. The Christian must always consider the future and let that future view or influence 
how he or she views the present. That is the only way we can even afford a smile. Even when the odds are against us. Because we know that the God of the present is the God of the future. And he's the one who promises that I will spread prosperity over Jerusalem like a river. And you know when rivers are flowing, whatever, whatever they meet, they will flow over it. So he's saying that what I will do will make you even forget the past and the present. It will flow over every aspect and every facet of your life. So my dear friends, as we go through this month of July, and as we go through the rest of the year, always remember that rejoice even when you are sitting in ashes because God can always do more than we can think of whatever you imagine. The gospel reading gives us what I term kingdom values. How we shouldn't condescend to materialism and how the world looks at things but how we should look at things from the perspective of the kingdom. And here I want to mention three of them. There are many in the gospel. The first one, that whole idea of Jesus picking the 72 and sending them ahead of where he intended to visit and giving them the power to do what he wanted them to do. And yeah, what comes to mind is that kingdom value of delegation. Jesus, our master, didn't think he should do everything by himself. There were times he would call the 12. Now he's calling the 72 and he's delegating them with power and authority to places where he intends to visit. The second one is when he sends them out in pairs. Why would he do that? Not only because we say two hairs are better than one, but also because so that they can encourage one another and draw strength from one another as they spread the kingdom. Friends, if you put these two together, delegation and the second one, teamwork, Jesus gives us a way of how we should carry out our responsibilities even in our present world. You go into organizational behavior and every organization will stress delegation and teamwork. And I'm sure those of you who were writing your series not too long ago would put there, I am a good team player. But friends, these originate from the Bible. So if you are in a position of authority here, maybe you are crumbling with all the high BP and the low BP and everything because you are afraid to delegate. Maybe it's because also you have delegated and people have left you down big time. And therefore you think you must do all by yourself. But the message goes both ways. When people trust you and they delegate power to you, don't let them down. Because you see the apostles coming back and rejoicing. God, they had done it so well. They even saw Satan falling. They were happy. Because when God gave them the chance, when Jesus gave them the power, they did it so well and they came back happy. Sadly, sometimes when people have trusted us and they have delegated power onto us, we do things that in our own consciences we are not able to rejoice when we have to report. The apostles didn't do that. 
but please learn from them. And if you are here also, and delegation is not in your vocabulary, so once you are not there, the job cannot function, think about it. And learn from the paradigm of Jesus. The next one is on teamwork. Sometimes, my dear friends, we are filled with so much competition that even in the team, we want to outshine one another. So when somebody has freely opened his or her heart to share every idea, you sit down quietly as if you have nothing to share. But all you are doing is to take the person's idea, add it to yours, so that when the appraiser comes, they can say you are an outstanding staff. Jesus sent them out in pairs. They came back rejoicing in pairs. They did the work together as a team. So let us not be driven by so much selfishness that we must be the only ones who should be first. And therefore, even in the team, not only undermine one another, but also prevent others from being successful. And here, my dear friends, don't think of only teamwork in organizations. Think of teamwork even in your own homes. He sent them out in pairs. So God has sent you and your husband or you and your wife together in a pair to be in your home. How do you operationalize this idea of teamwork? How do you do it? Think about it. You were sent together to be a team to run your home. How do you do it? Now to my final point. Jesus will tell the apostles or the disciples that whichever town you enter and they don't welcome you, Shake the very dust of that town off your feet. Here, what Jesus is telling them is that, look, no matter what you do, not every attempt of yours will be successful. Sometimes you will face discouragement. Sometimes you will face failure. And the reason is simple. You can do everything in your power thinking that you are succeeded. But sometimes, success depends on the person at the receiving end. So even though they have proclaimed the message, because the town would not welcome them, they will meet failure and discouragement. But what does Jesus mean that shake it off? It is because he knows what discouragement and failure can do to us. Because sometimes we think that if I failed, it's because I did something wrong. Because God wasn't there with me. Forgetting that when Jesus was sending his people, he told them that you would also meet failure. But the important thing is not allowing those moments of discouragement to stop you from pursuing what you know is right. That is why he would tell them, shake it off. Because, my dear friends, we all know what discouragement does. Sometimes it drives us into depression. Sometimes it drives us to even habits that we are not proud of. But Jesus knows that discouragement is one of the greatest weapons the devil has against disciples. Because it always makes us settle for mediocrity. It is paralyzing and prevents us from achieving our God-given potentials. So he says, shake it off. Don't allow it to take the better part of you. So in this mass, my dear brothers and sisters, yes, we are praying that God's prosperity should flow over each and every one of us. 
We are praying for the grace to be able to even rejoice when we are sitting in ruins because we know the God of the future can do more than we can think of or imagine. We are praying to be able to have the courage to delegate. And we are praying that when others have trusted us and have delegated power onto us, we won't let them down. We will do it so well that the disciples did. We are praying that when we meet moments of discouragement, moments of failure, we won't allow them to paralyze us by trusting in the God who has sent us out there, the God we pray to every day, even as we receive the Eucharist today, would ask for the grace to keep fighting on, trusting in his mercies and his love for us. Amen.